The Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Land Trust. Did you know sportsmen spend over $5 billion annually in hunter and angler access fees? Land Trust is a platform that connects sportsmen with farmers and ranchers like you who have untapped profits just by providing access to their land. Go to landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to see how much you might add to your bottom line. Greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason, but you knew that because it said so in the introduction. I've got a great show to you to put on for you today because I have two awesome guests. I just have been talking to these guys pre-recording and they've got a good story to tell about a business that's a little bit out there on the fringe compared to what we normally think of when we think of production agriculture. Uh, I've got Mark Harris, the CEO, and Dr. Alan Williams, the advisor partner with B. BDA Farms out of Uniontown, Alabama. Uh, they came across my radar and I thought, this is interesting. Mostly direct to consumer meats and also organic vegetables. But this is not, I know you're thinking, Damien, come on, man, you had your little hobby beef operation. That's all cool. But this is the business of agriculture. We want to talk about scale. We want to talk about doing real business. Well, how about if I told you these are 6,000 acre operators? That's right, six comma zero zero zero, six thousand acres, and they are actually of scale. And I actually brought them on here because I said, "Wait a minute, man! This is not just some guy that uh, you know dropped out of corporate and wants to walk around his Birkenstocks with a you know a garden of organic arugula. This is the real deal." So, welcome to the business of agriculture, Mark and Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay, so. Um, what what we got here is this BDA Farms, and you've got, I think, like 15 employees, 6,000 acres. You're doing almost or mostly direct-to-consumer, and you're pushing the regenerative agricultural model, selling meat and vegetables. Let's just go ahead. Give me the lowdown. Uh, Mark, you're the CEO, so if you're showing up at my uh, Rotary Club, tell me about BDA Farms. BDA started in 2012, which used to be the farm started as a row crop farm and they row cropped about four years ago. The ground was all basically, we didn't use it to soil up. So we started going a different route and started being regenerative. And that's when we got with Dr. Alan Williams and uh, he can explain more of the stuff on the regenerative part and basically what we, we got going on. Cause he's the, he's the one that advises us on which way to go. Mark, you are not a stranger to agriculture. You are a multi-generational Alabama farmer from a conventional background. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So you were out there growing cotton and peanuts and corn and right. beans. Tell me about it. Yeah, we we done all of that. We did cotton, uh, soybeans, corn, but we did it. I mean, we used all chemical. We did. We put granular fertilizer down and doing it a totally different way. I was just interested in the way that this was going and, and it just got my attention. And so that's, that's where we hit it. And we don't use nothing chemical or anything out here to farm. We are, uh, we can't even put anything on ant bed. When so, did you come, when did you come into the fold with BDA? 2012. Okay. So when they said, when they said, we're going to make this, they were still row crop, Conventional right. operation. That's right? what we started. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. And then made the transition into what you're doing now. Just how four, long? four years ago. Okay. Wow. All right. Alan Williams, uh, you, uh, you, you came in the fold when and give me some background on you and then coming to BDA. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a sixth generation family farmer. Uh, family started their farm in 1840. Uh, so, and I grew up there, um, also spent about 15 years in academia. Uh, so I was a researcher and a professor with my last stop at Mississippi State University and go uh, Bulldogs, go Bulldogs. There you go. And, uh, good land, and, good land grant university, you know, we got to like that. That's right. That's right. Uh, but so after 15 years in, I left academia in the year 2000 as a tenured full professor and, and decided to do something very, very different. So went back in full time to farming and ranching, but doing it a very different way, doing it what we term today regeneratively uh, and also consulting. So uh, my partners and I in another business, Understanding Ag and the Soil Health Academy, 
uh, form that business. And we've consulted with people all over North America and in uh, more than 34 different countries in regenerative ag to date. Uh, I became involved at BDA Farm uh, in 2017 as we, as the farm was making this transition and initially as a consultant and then, you know, later I was added as a partner. And uh, so, so what we've done since that point in time has made a radical shift. Uh, we, we have sold all the tillage equipment mm -hmm. that, that existed here, that's gone. And we've transitioned from a, you know, a row crop operation, basically a, uh, organic commodity row crop operation uh, to predominantly a regenerative livestock, multi-species livestock, and the certified organic gardens. And that's our, our core focus today. And again, we focus on everything being done in a manner that restores, rebuilds, revitalizes yeah. the ecosystems that exist on this farm and in the surrounding area. So I'm at, the history there is BDA at one point was your basic conventional row crops and chemical chemistry and everything, and then switched over to organic row crop. Is that right? No. Well, it, it was conventional prior to being purchased in 2012. Okay. okay? And then transitioned to organic after that. Uh, but, but yeah, the prior history is that the whole land base had been managed very, very conventionally prior to 2012. Okay, then then um, organic and then organic becomes regenerative, and they're not necessarily always the same. Am I right? That is correct. Exactly. <clears throat> okay, so kind of give uh, to the person that's out here. You know, I've got a bunch of listeners. They might be working for a chemical company driving down the road right now, or they might be a, a farmer. They might be in the cranberry business, ranching. They're saying, wait a minute, man, what's all the difference here? And the truth is, I see a merging of all of them in the future. I, I, I talk about yep. that in my book. I see the best practices of conventional merging with the best practice of regenerative with the best practices of organic, because what the hell difference does it make? What we're really trying to do here is create something that's profitable and serves a, a, a market, you know? So give us the yep. background and the difference, if you will. Yeah, I'd be very happy to. So basically with regenerative, we are following what we call the 643. That's the six principles of soil health, the four ecosystem processes and the three rules of adaptive stewardship. And, and we write a lot about that and have a lot of information about that. If anybody wants detail on our understandingag.com website. Understandingag.com under, understanding talks about the 643 principle. Again, they're the six principles of soil health, four. Ecosystem processes. And three. And, and the three rules of adaptive stewardship. Okay, so real quickly then, we said the difference between organic and uh, regenerative, it's, they kind of can go together down the same aisle, but they're not necessarily the same because in Gabe Brown's book, Dirt to Soil, which I read, he's, yeah. not a, he's, not, he's not opposed to using herbicide if need be. Uh, That's correct. He, he opts not to, but says there's a time and place where herbicide works. Yeah, so, so really what it boils down to, Damien, is this. In regenerative you still have all the tools available to you in your toolbox. And that can include herbicides, fungicides, tillage, whatever, right? They're still there. They're still in your toolbox. We just try to use them much more judiciously yeah. and ask ourselves, why do we really need to use this tool? And if we do, and it has the potential to be a little bit destructive at the moment of use, what practices do we need to follow that with to be able to repair any damage that we may have done. Whereas with certified organic, you have immediately removed about 90% of the tools in your toolbox. Yeah. yeah. I mean, organic all of a sudden, uh, you know, I used to say that about the beef thing. My cattle were not certified organic, but I said, they've, they've not had anything uh, and they're out here on pasture. They do get conventional grain. But I said, I said, we had three calves that got hoof rot in a particularly wet year. You want me to treat that animal or have it hobbling around out there? You know, if you're right. organic, you can't do that. Hey, Mark, talk about, speaking of cattle, tell me about the product mix. I want to be a customer of BDA Farms. I'm turned on already. What am I buying from you? Yeah, our, our cattle is all grass finished. We don't feed them no grains. Everything that, that we uh, finish out here is uh, grass finished. 
Okay. And we, we run Angus and South Pole. Angus, Angus crossed Angus. with South Pole. South Pole? Yes. Okay. okay, that stumps me. Tell me about a South Pole. Just I'm a cattle guy. Yeah, the, the South Pole were developed uh, actually by Teddy Gentry of the country music group Alabama fame. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I started working with Teddy about 25 years ago in development of this breed, but it, it's a breed that was developed specifically to be adapted to the deep south, the heat and humidity of the deep south without any Zebu or Brahmin breeding in them. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, and, and they have worked very, very well for us. And, uh, and Mark can tell you about the other products as well that, I, that we offer beyond the grass. Right, so yeah, you got, you got beef out there uh, on yep. grass and then you got lamb and you got pork and you also yep. have chickens for eggs. Tell me about those operations. Our, our chickens are pasture raised. We, we run uh, just laying hens. We run a few thousand of them. And uh, then on our sheep, our sheep, we got a couple hundred head of sheep that we run. They, everything is uh, pasture raised and our hogs are pasture raised. All right, on the on the laying hens, is this that deal where you're kind of moving these portable buildings around so that they're always and then they're the idea is they're are they getting fed or are they just eating worms and bugs? No, we we feed them. Um, <laughs> it's a, a laying pellet that's non GMO corn and just the proteins. But we do move their houses every other day, and they're free range. We got uh, dogs that protects them that lives out there with them. That's cool. Same, same way with our sheep. We move our sheep about every other day. Sometimes they get moved twice a day. Okay. And then hogs. All right. Are you the reason that there's these feral hogs running around? Are you just letting these pigs run around and grow tusks and all of a sudden? Are you the, are you the reason we have African swine fever in China? Come on, man. <laughs> no, sir. We tell all of our neighbors that uh, if they see a hog, it's going to be a wild one. So you need to get rid of it. So if you if your neighbors see a hog, shoot it because it's not yours. That's right. you, tell me about your hog. I've always wondered about pasture pork. So they are contained in some degree. They're out running around, and then are they in pens? No, they we, we run them in poly wire. It's an electric fence. Okay. And then and the, we we move them basically the same way about every other day, depending on the weather and what type of rain we get. You have to move them regularly. Hogs eat. So uh, so Damien eat. on. Just so, so I know this, how do you, what are you feeding them hogs? Because they eat about anything. So if a, if a squirrel's out there, they'll eat a squirrel, but they'll also eat corn. So what do you got? What, how do you feed these hogs? They, they, we feed them non-GMO corn and grain mix. And then they root around, they root around for stuff when they're out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you got all these products and then you're saying, okay, that's really cool. Who buys these things? Who are your customers? Who are your customers? Yeah. Yeah, so our customers uh, are the consumer, the direct consumer. So we do deliver direct to the consumer. Uh, we also market to restaurants in our region as well as retail grocery. We also have a CSA that uh, that we market to. Yes, sir. There are, there are some people listening that do not know what that means. Community supported agriculture. Uh, and what's that so mean? that means a group of consumers that. Uh, you know, supports local farms and buys from local farms. Uh, so we have our own CSA that specifically buys from BDA and counts on being able to buy from us on a weekly and monthly basis. Uh, we have three delivery vans uh, that, and so we actually deliver to certain areas. We deliver to the Birmingham and Tuscaloosa areas and the greater areas and then more regional to us here in Uniontown. And we will also uh, pack and fulfill to anywhere within a two-day ground ship area. So anybody that's within a two-day ground ship area can place an order via our website, and we will pack and fulfill straight from the farm to them. All right. Now, uh, I've, I've seen a real struggle to get meat processed you know, it's one thing to say, all right, you've built some branding, you've got some marketing, you've presumably you've got an online presence, your website's beautiful, I've been to it, but that's all cool. But I know that you two aren't butchering cattle right now. What happens when when those things, when those hogs are, are finished and, and those, you know, those lambs and everything else, what happens to them? Because it's a struggle right now to get stuff processed. What are you doing with them? Yeah, so we do have a processing partner that we work with. 
Uh, and you're right, that's critically important. You've, you've got to find the right processor that has the capabilities that you need and can, can meet both the numbers, you know, that can adequately slaughter and process the numbers that we deal with and also provide us with the type of further fabrication or processing ability and the packaging that we need that's appealing to our customer base. So we have worked very hard to develop a processing partner and, and we do have that partner that we work with routinely. Um, eggs, they don't need as much processing, but they still need, uh, they, they're getting gathered obviously every day. And then do they go to a processing facility and, and get washed and packaged? What happens to the eggs? We have a uh, egg washing facility here that they all, all of our eggs are done on site. They are gathered twice a day and bring into the egg shed. And they we got an egg cleaning machine that weighs them, candles them, and then they pack them in the flats, either cartons, and they go out from there. How many dozen eggs per day, week, or month do you sell? Do you know? Uh, well, you 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 can we we I can tell you we're getting about a little over four thousand eggs a day right now. Okay. And we, we, what would you say goes out a week on eggs? Well, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're marketing pretty much everything that we produce. Uh, you know, so, so it's about 4,000 eggs a day lay rate right now. And, uh, and as Mark said, we, we're marketing those both through cases and there's 15 dozen in a case. And those typically go to, uh, the grocery stores and the restaurants. And, and we also have some food co-ops that are purchasing by the case. And then everything direct to consumer is being marketed by the typical dozen that everybody's familiar with. Sure. And so if I buy a typical dozen at a grocery store, has it got a BDA Farms brand name on it or is there a different brand name? Nope. If it's in a grocery store and if it's our eggs, it's going to be in our, our BDA cart. And if I go and buy your basic Winn-Dixie or Safeway or Kroger eggs, I don't know, let's say they're $1.29 a dozen right now, maybe $1.39 a dozen. What am I, what am I paying for yours? Double that? Well, our eggs are there in most grocery stores are going to be somewhere between five and $6 a dozen. Uh, but that is the same price that Vital Farms or Pete and Jerry's or any of the other pastured egg producers eggs are sold for in the same grocery stores. Don't get defensive. I like people making money. I wasn't asking to belittle you. I was asking because I just was curious. I'm all about yeah, profit absolutely. margin. Absolutely. You know what? I'm all about making I don't have a winter home in Arizona because I try and give shit away. All right. I'm all for making money. All right. Let's talk frankly here about money. Mark. Yeah. Um, you know, you're a farm guy. There's a certain amount of skepticism that all of us farm guys have. Is this just some rich guy's passion project or is BDA farms truly making money? We're, we're make, we have to make money. This is not, I mean, we, we're here. The BDA farm is, um, it was designed by the owners for it to be an educational tour, profitable farm. And that's, that's what we try to do. We try to raise stuff that's healthier for us and our customers yep. and, and, and basically just try to teach people. But yes, we have to be profitable. Okay. So it's not just some rich guy that like was a co-founder of Google that said, I'm going to go back to Alabama and I have this little passion project and tell, yeah, no, you're saying that actually is making money. Yes, sir. That's good to hear. You talked about uh, tourism on your website. You've got something kind of cool going on. You've got uh, an old uh, couple of like an old mansion, like right out of, you know, uh, antebellum South. It looked like to me a beautiful facility. And you even bought like an old bank in a uh, small town in Alabama and it converted all this stuff, made it nice. And so if I want to bring my family there, I can rent the place uh, on your farm. So tell me about the tourism aspect of your business. Yes, yeah, so we have a we have a few places that we use for uh, people to come and stay. We have a house called the Trawick House. We got the vault and we got Reverie, which is the big house you're talking about. And we have people that come and stay in them that comes tours the farms or comes to events. We use the vault, the down part, downstairs part of the vault is used for a lot of the understanding ag classes. And what's the other Stockman? Yeah, Stockman Grass Farmer, Soil Health Academy. Yeah. Uh, we do host. Uh, <laughs> 
events throughout the year. Uh, we have tour groups that come through quite often. Uh, just in the month of July alone, uh, we had more than 14 tours during that month with, with people coming in. And this year alone, we've had people from uh, more than 34 different states and five different countries that, that have come and toured the farm so far. That's fantastic. I want to ask you some more about the tourism, plus a couple of other little things that you're doing there, or not even little things, big things you're doing there. But I want to remind our listeners about the, the project I'm working on. It's not a passion project, although I am, I am very emotionally invested and personally and physically and monetarily invested in the business of agriculture, as you well know. I've started a new thing here in the last few months with extreme ag. And if you're a farmer or an agricultural person that you would like to look at how to up your game, these are conventional farmers uh, that are doing product trials on large scale operations. These are record setters, you know, National Corn Growers and Soybean Growers Association record setters. And they found a thing called Extreme Ag. Extreme Ag, there's no E, just extremeag.farm is their website. And I've got a podcast called Cutting the Curve. So if you are a farmer looking to hear insights, information from farmers that are progressive-minded, forward-thinking operators, trying out a bunch of new things with new trials. Check out the Cutting the Curve podcast for business practices, agricultural practices, things that they are doing. And these farms are from Alabama. They're from Arkansas, North Carolina, Illinois, Iowa, and South Dakota. So it's it's all across, really, the, uh, the, nor- you know, the uh, United States uh, agriculturally. So check out extremeag.farm, and you can see the podcast, Cutting the Curve, that I'm creating video content that you can apply to your farming operation. All right, back to my friends at BDA Farms of Uniontown, Alabama, a 6,000 acre regenerative agricultural operation selling direct to consumer, but also to restaurants and grocery stores, lamb, beef, eggs, pork, and vegetables. What? All right, tell us about the vegetable side. Mark, again, what is this? You, You went out there like your wife said, Mark. What about the vegetarians? You know, instead of all this meat, what if you like grew a little window box with some a- eggplants? So you got like six eggplants. Is that what you're doing down there? No, so we run in about, we have a, about a 10 acre organic garden that we run different times of the year, you know, your season and stuff. But we do a lot of herbs, a lot of Southern grown vegetables and stuff. And a lot of it is to cater to the restaurants and Stuff like that, but it's uh, so all, all, the 10 uh, acres is a big garden, but it's a small farm. So, is the idea that demand grows and this becomes 20, becomes 50, becomes 100 acres? Because, you know, if you get the demand, and you can probably get a couple growing seasons out in that part of Alabama, right? You could be getting stuff for half the year, maybe. I'm thinking, tell me about the plan for the future. We're, we're growing year round. Uh, so, so yes, we have year round, uh, crops that we're growing in the gardens and, uh, you know, and we can easily expand to, we can double that. We can triple the size of that without any problem at all. Okay. Is the demand going to be there to justify that? Could this be, could this be 20 acres two years from now? Well, we started with the garden with three acres, four years. So you've, you've tripled already four years now. Um, The stuff you're producing, yeah, I mean, you're in a different climatological zone than I am here in northern Indiana. So I'm thinking, you know, you got winter greens and you got summer stuff. I mean, tell me what kind of stuff you're selling. You can say all the names. Some of them I can't remember. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so so yes, and and you're exactly right. We have, uh, we basically have four different seasonal crops or, or groups of crops you know so we have our our summer our fall our winter and our spring cropping seasons yep. and so yes we're growing you know vegetables and herbs that are appropriate for those different times of the year uh to i'll give you some of our top selling items uh tomatoes are one of our best selling items uh and that includes both the the cherry and the grape tomatoes and all of that uh our restaurants absolutely go crazy over the cherry and the grape tomatoes. And and those are a very, very hot selling item. We produce a lot of uh, different types of squash, cucumber, those types of things, eggplant, uh, Swiss chard. 
uh, believe it or not, it is a very, very good seller for us. So we'll grow a lot of Swiss chard, particularly Swiss chard. Rest. Swiss Swiss chard is like a, a cross between a spinach or lettuce or a, or a kale. Am I right? Yeah, so sort of like a kale on steroids. Okay. Uh, yeah, and multicolored. So it, so it's like a a rainbow colored kale on steroids would be the best way to describe it. Uh, Very, very beautiful crop. We also do strawberries in season. Uh, We do potatoes and sweet potatoes, uh, okra, sweet corn, all of those types of things. And then we grow about every green and lettuce that you can imagine. Uh, And and those are very big sellers, sellers for us. So many different types of lettuces, different types of greens, cabbages, and so forth. So it, it's a robust combination. We'll also have things like ginseng and turmeric and uh, uh, garlic and onion and basil and all of those types of herbs that we grow as well. Uh, you got 15 employees. Um, I'm guessing the, the vegetables are pretty labor intensive. Uh, sheep, eh, I don't know. Uh, go drive by and check them once in a while, right? I mean, come on. Uh, is bulk of the employee, and then, of course, the eggs, that's an everyday thing. So tell me what these employees are doing out there. Seems like there's a few things that are going to take up more time, a few things take up less time. Plus, there's the interface with the customers. So what, what's it look like around BDA Farms in terms of what activity is happening and who's doing it? On the, the garden side, of, we have four workers on the garden. And then we have two guys that takes care of the chickens. We have one guy that does our sheep and our pigs. And the rest of the guys work with the cattle and the uh, maintenance, doing the stuff around the farm, fence work, all that. Now, uh, the 6,000 acres, there's some trees or some pasture. There's lots of pasture. What happens on those acres? Tell me about the breakout on those. You can break that down because there's some only running – yeah, uh, so be very happy to. Uh, you, so again, are, talk- you are planting stuff. You are planting stuff for the critters to eat. Are you putting out some wheat or some some you know sedan grass or uh, some forage crops, some clovers? What, yep. what, tell me what happens on those acres. Yeah, so so here's the combination of what we have. Uh, so we have uh, you know quite a few perennial acres. Yep. Uh, that's a rather robust mix of both. Uh, warm season and cool season, uh, grasses, legumes, and forbs and broadleaves. Uh, I've documented now more than 120 different plant species that our livestock eat that are growing in our perennial pastures with more than four dozen of those being actual native plant species that have existed in this area for a very long time. So, So our perennial pastures are very robust, very diverse, We also plant annuals, both warm season and cool season annuals. And we, those are also diverse mixes or we call them complex cover crop mixes. And that will be a combination of various grasses, legumes, and forbs that we plant there. So brassicas, you know, clovers, vetches, that type of thing, as well as a number of uh, small grains, warm season and cool season. And we utilize all of those acres for our livestock, you know, during different periods of the year. And then we have woodland acres and we manage those woodland acres in in a multiplicity of ways. Uh, One one is obviously growth of timber, harvestable timber that we can harvest on a routine basis. We also use our, our woodland as recreation for hunting uh, and support of our wildlife. Our woodland is also used for grazing. So at different times of the year, we'll have sheep, cattle, and pigs that are actually grazed in the woodland. So our woodland has a multiplicity of uses, and and that's very purposeful. We don't want it to be just, you know, a one-use type deal. And we're, we're constantly trying to come up with ways to expand the use of our woodland. For instance, we're examining ways relative to our agritourism to put in hiking trails, running trails, those types of things. We would like to start hosting uh, 5K, 10K events, the warrior runs, uh, you know, even cross country events 
those types of things. And we're also have seen a tremendous growth in our beneficial insect pollinator and bird populations. So we also want to start hosting Audubon Society events and, and, and those types of things for conservation groups. So, uh, by the way, my forestry consultant people would say that the damage that we did to the woodlands around here mm-hmm. in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s was because we stuck uh, hogs and cattle in all these woodlands. Are you sure you're doing right by your forest by putting these critters in there? Yes, absolutely. It's correct from a historical ecological context. Uh, when you look at all of the southern, the historical uh, land base here in the southern tier of the U.S., you know, pre-European settlement, uh, this was heavily populated. We, we had southern prairies, true prairies. Then we had our southern savanna woodland. So it was much more savanna-like than it was dense, thick, choked woodland that we see today. So, and we also had wetland that existed down here. Mm-hmm. And so historically, there were eastern bison that roamed through this area, as well as elk as well as the deer. So we have multiple ruminant, wild ruminant species that once heavily populated this entire region. And so they were correct in terms of a historical ecological impact and context. And so all we're doing is simulating what the wild ruminants once did in our woodland here. And we work with foresters as well. And what we have found is that by putting the livestock back into the woods, now keep in mind though, they're moved every day. Yeah, you're, okay? you're not, so, the point I was making is yes, the, the old farmers here would put these cattle in there saying that woods isn't worth nothing. And by God, after 10 years of those cows and they're trampling around in the roots, it wasn't worth nothing. That's true. So you're, you're doing it in a more judicious manner as you've talked about. That's right. And what we find is that if you move them every day, that's simulating for the wild ruminants once did. They never stayed in one place in the woods either, right? right. They, they, they were constantly stuff, on the move. Some stuff and move on. Uh, yes. A couple of things here. Regenerative. You've used mm-hmm. the word, Gabe Brown, book. I'm all about some of the practices. I talk about it in my own book, Food Fear, where I talk about there's a lot of these practices that are actually just smart stewardship. We're going to use some of this. Are you regenerating? Are you regenerating? Tell me about, you know, it's only been four years, but what are you seeing? You know, we all, we all like the soil. We all like the dirt. We all, yep. we're all, we're all about this here at agriculture. What are you seeing? So very good question and be very happy to answer that. And because we are not just a for-profit farm, but we are also here to serve as a teaching model uh, to other farmers and ranchers throughout the deep South and the entire country. Um, We have been, from day one, we've been carefully monitoring and tracking the progress. So we have a number of different parameters that we're measuring. First of all, we have a suite of soil tests that we do every year, the Haney, the PLFA, and the TND test are conducted every year. Hey, 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 we're closing out this podcast and you're all of a sudden going off the deep end here, Professor. I know it, I know it. <clears throat> that, that, so, so let me put it in much simpler terms, okay? We are monitoring the physical, chemical, and, and biological characteristics of our soil. We are measuring every year water infiltration and retention rates of our soil. And go. we even have what are called aquaspy probes that are out on our farm that monitor 24-7, 365 soil moisture, soil temperature, plant root growth, all of those types of things. Uh, And we have set up transects that allow us to be able to monitor every year our plant species diversity, insect species diversity, and bird species populations and diversity. And those are all good things because it keeps the ecosystem uh, more healthy and in balance, what I'm hearing. Hey, Mark. And they're indicators. They're indicators of your regenerative progress. Mark, before the professor went to the faculty lounge here and started throwing all these big words around, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, and I got two more questions, and that's it <laughs> for you about the business. Is this thing is is this thing capped out? Or is this going to continue to grow? This thing of direct to consumer, you know what? What's your gut tell you? You've been around agriculture. Is this going is this going to be profitable ten years from now? Is there going to be more of it? Are you going what's it going to look like? 
I, I think it's going to grow. I think you're going to see a lot more people farming this away because it's uh, it's better for the land, which, like Doc said, we, we're here to be stewards, and we just want to leave the place better than what we found it. And I think a lot of other farmers will eventually do the same thing. And then my other last statement then would be with uh, uh, Alan about the future. You are in a the Understanding Ag and some of your other affiliations. You are on an advisory committee or uh, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I do have conversations with Secretary Vilsack. So when you look at the future based on those conversations and those affiliates and, and uh, involvement, what do you see? Yeah. So so here's what's happening on the bigger picture scale. Uh, first of all, yes, we're having routine, pretty much weekly conversations with Secretary Vilsack and Robert Bonney, one of it, one of his uh, chief under under deputies. And uh, you know, th those have been outstanding conversations. Uh, they're keenly interested in being able to integrate regenerative principles and practices into what they're doing within the USDA. Uh, so we're helping them with uh, how to feasibly integrate those practices into both what they're doing and advocating and into the future farm bill development. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, I can share with you and your audience that, you know, there's a lot of major food companies that now also have made definitive moves into regenerative agriculture. And that includes companies like General Mills and Danone, Foremost, Nestle, Vital Farms, and so forth. Yeah, there's some big names, and I talk yeah. about in here, but you say made moves, okay? In my yep. book, my research found about a thing called Kernza, a perennial wheat type of a crop. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it doesn't involve as much uh, tillage, so you're not going to tear up, and so you're going to save money there. You're going to save environmental impact there. You're going to stay off the ground. There's less compaction. And also, you're going to more water retention. So I thought that's cool. And General Mills was behind it. Used to be that food companies didn't go out and talk about pioneering um, new technologies in the field so much. Is that what we're talking about when you say they're making initiatives? What's that mean? Are they going to just tell you you've got to do this? Or are they going to actually be partners? What are we seeing? Yeah. So here's here's what's happening. Boots on the ground. Okay. Uh, these companies are actually paying for first of all educational workshops for the producers, the farmers and ranchers that are producing for them. So they're putting their money where their mouth is and anteing up to help uh, these producers get the education and regenerative ag principles and practices that they need to actually do this on their own farms. And then they're also helping the produce, they're paying for the producers to have follow-up consultation uh, so that after they get that initial education, they have ongoing support to help them as they go through the process of implementing and transitioning to regenerative. So your gut and actually my gut and my reading and, and uh, research along with your experience tells you and me that we're gonna see more push towards some of these practices. It's gonna be either from the corporations that buy our stuff or, or the government that uh, oversees stuff from USDA? That, that's correct. It, it has already started, and it, it, it's starting to, to definitely snowball now. I think, um, I think we'll leave it there. His name is Alan Williams. He did a really good job, Mark, except for he thought he was back at Mississippi State trying to put on some sort of demonstration that he was the smartest guy in the room. And his name is Mark <laughs> Harris. Mark's, uh, Mark's uh, the, the uh, what do you call yourself down there at BDA Farms? Uh, they call me a lot of stuff. I, I just, I don't use the big words like Dr. Allen does. He makes <laughs> words up. Uh, all right. And if somebody wants to do business with you, where do they find you, Mark? They can go online and look at bdafarms.com. And it's a, good website. it's a good website. I've been there. All right. Mark Harris, Alan Williams. My name is Damian Mace. Remind you uh, to share this with uh, everybody, you know, because there's some really good content here. And also, uh, if you're a farmer and you want to check out what's happening over Extreme Ag, go check out ExtremeAg.farm. That's Xtreme, no E, Extreme Ag. Dot farm. Check that out. Uh, until next time, this is the Business of Agriculture podcast. I think this is a great episode. I really appreciate you guys being here. And I do encourage anybody, you know what? This ain't for everybody, but 
it's neat to see folks that are taking on this thing and saying, Hey, what if we can change some of the system and change what we're doing? I think it's really cool what you guys are doing there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. Thank you for tuning into the business of agriculture podcast sponsored by land trust land trust partners with farmers and ranchers to capture pure profit from sportsmen seeking new experiences and places to hunt and fish. Land Trust built the platform and does the marketing. You maintain 100% control of access and activities, and you set the rules. There's no cost or obligation when you list, and the next 10 Business of Agriculture listeners who go to landtrust.com BOA are eligible for a gift worth over $2,000.